Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Joe Scott from Clemson, and he will talk about uh, achievability analysis for nonlinear systems. Okay, th so so thanks for the introduction. Um, I, I always like to do my knowledge instruments in advance so I don't run out of time and forget them. So um, this is uh, what I'm going to talk about today was, was uh, supported by the Airport's Office of Scientific Research. And uh, my, my students, Kai Shen and, and Shui Jiao Yang, did most of, of what I'll show you. Um, so a brief overview of, of what my lab does. It's not really uh, much to do with symbolic computing, so I want to give you an impression of where I'm coming from. About a third of my lab does advanced process control, which is my interest in dynamic systems. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, our work in uncertainty propagation or reachability analysis, which we're using primarily for um, verification problems and for fault detection and, and diagnosis problems. Um, but we also have a, a significant bunch of the group that does optimization theory and algorithms, typically for guaranteed global optimization with um, uh, lots of applications in, in uh, decomposition algorithms for chemical process design, uh, uh, optimal power flow problems, and, and so forth. Uh, and then we do a lot of, uh, a fair number of, of modeling and applications, so developing dynamic models for various chemical um, uh, process models. So um, I was very surprised when Leb sent me the invitation to come speak in a, a you know, essentially a differential geometry seminar, and um, what's the specific title of the? Differential algebra. Okay. algebra. Differential algebra, yeah, 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 see, so, I mean, those, I don't know, even know the difference between those hardly, so. Um, so I, I will say, as a, as a chemical engineer with a, a background in optimization theory um, and control, I, I'm essentially an applied mathematician more than a chemical engineer, but, uh, so I, 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 my, I have training in, in uh, real analysis and functional analysis and complex analysis and dynamic systems, but not, not beyond that in terms of, of, uh, of formal mathematics. So that's sort of um, uh, uh, where I'm coming from. And, and, and essentially what Gleb explained to me is that you all have an interest in, in dynamic systems and reachability analysis, in particular in symbolic computing. And I know very little about symbolic computing, but I hope at the very least to give you um, a, a potentially interesting application of, of symbolic computing to reachability analysis. Um, but most of what I'll show you is, is at the moment done numerically. So this is the, um, the basic math problem that everything I'll, I, I want to show you today is, is based on. And it's, it's, it's very simple to write down. So essentially, I, I have a, a nonlinear system of, of differential equations. It's, everything's a vector. So this is, it can be a high dimensional system. Um, x is the state. And everything is parameterized by this vector p. Uh, which is, is an uncertain parameter. And so, so this p-value can affect the, the right-hand side. It can also affect the initial conditions. And the only thing I assume about p is that it, it lies in some compact set. Um, so when we actually do the computations, I'll assume that's an n-dimensional interval, so upper and lower bounds on, on all the values. Um, so these could be model parameters. They can be ranges for uh, uh, disturbances and, and so forth. Obviously, for every different choice of p, I get a, a different trajectory uh, out of the system. Or if you prefer to think about this in, in, in state space, there's some, some blob here that's the set of, of, of possible solutions at any given fixed time. And what I'm interested in, in computing in the context of reachability analysis is what I call state bounds, which is some time varying upper trajectory and, and lower trajectory uh, that, that's guaranteed to contain this whole, whole bundle of, uh, of trajectories at each instant in time. And in state space, that's just going to look like a, a box at each instant in time around the possible reachable set. Um, so I'm interested in, in a guaranteed enclosure of the reachable set rather than a, an approximation of it. This is because the applications we're interested in are in um, verification and safety analysis and that sort of thing where I'd like to say if, if this entire box doesn't intersect some unsafe region of the space, then I can be certain that, that none of my, my actual solutions are unsafe. Um, and we're interested in doing this for a lot of online control algorithms. So, so the, the challenge here is is it turns out it's not too difficult to get a guaranteed uh, outer bound in this sense. It's quite difficult to make it as accurate as I've drawn it. Typically, it looks like like that, right? And um, and if you want it to get, if you want to make it accurate, it, it takes a long time. So the challenge here is we want to be able to do this fast enough for real for real time. And in cases where you don't have enough time to exhaustively sample a bunch of different trajectories, you need something faster than than sampling. Uh, we use this just as a means of uncertainty quantification in a lot of problems, just to try and understand what kind of solutions are possible. Uh, we're interested in applications in, in uh, robot motion planning. So if I have a vehicle tracking some reference trajectory, I'd like to guarantee that uh, under uncertainty, it's, it's, it's not going to meet any of these obstacles. 
Um, we have a, a very similar picture to this in, in the chemical uh, space, but instead of actual spatial dimensions, it's, it's say, compositions inside of a, of a reactor, and, and part of the state space might be a, um, where an explosion would be possible. And if you get too high of an oxygen concentration in some mixtures, for example, um, you go beyond an ignition limit, and you'd like to ensure that you're operating away from that um, boundary. We use it in, in fault detection, uh, autonomous vehicles. And then a big application, which is a bit harder to explain, is um, we actually develop algorithms that can solve um, optimization problems subject to nonlinear dynamic models with a guarantee of, of finding the globally optimal solution. And those are also based on the ability to compute these bounds as, as part of the algorithm. So we have lots of different reasons for doing this. Um, it would take too long to give you a real overview of all the different methods that, that people are using to do this. but. Um, so essentially, I mean, you have, on the one hand, sampling methods which don't give rigorous bounds and, and they turn out to be very expensive because, you know, you could just, as the, as the dimension of the uncertainty space gets larger, the, the more and more samples you need to fill that space. And then there are a bunch of methods that, that give you guaranteed enclosures, but the, in a nutshell, the, the state of the art is that there's this big trade-off between speed and accuracy. And so, so here's an example that we did back in 2013. This is a six-dimensional nonlinear system that represents some chemical reaction kinetics. And um, essentially, on the one hand, you have fast interval-based methods that will give you this upper bound and this lower bound. So the, the, red, the red solutions are your real trajectories here. And so these bounds pretty quickly become useless, but you can get them very quickly. Um, and then uh, the, a state-of-the-art method based on zonotopes that was popular in the control literature at the time gives these gray shaded bounds, which are, are fairly accurate, but they're taking um, six and a half CPU seconds, and so many hundreds of times more than, than, uh, than, than differential inequalities. And you know, if you're trying to do safety verification, this can be an unacceptably long time. So, And, and these references look quite recent. Say that? The okay. references. Uh, and, uh, many of these are for, for the different kinds of methods, yeah. So this 2013 paper is where the comparison comes from. Um, the gray shaded method here is, is from Altoff and Crow. Um, uh, a, a journal paper that slightly preceded that. Yeah, but they're fairly. But what is actually was it actually studied hundred years ago, or is this a recent, very recent thing? Interestingly, a lot of the theory that we use is is a hundred years old. But um, so this differential inequalities method, which is what I'm going to talk about, is um, actually the original work on this, or very nearly the original work, comes from this guy Mueller in, in Germany in the 1920s. But what they were using the upper and lower trajectories for was actually as a method of proof to show existence and uniqueness of solutions to certain equations. There, it, there was obviously no computation associated with it at the time. But that's where the theory originally comes from. Um, so, so that's so that's sort of the state of things. And so our objective is we wanted to try and find some simple and effective means to dramatically reduce the conservatism of this differential inequalities method without compromising the efficiency. So to explain that a little bit, um, because we're interested in online control applications, we're really, really attached to that computation time. And, and so the goal was, can we take the basic idea of this method and find some cheap ways to, to really um, reduce the conservatism there? So uh, this is how differential inequalities works. Um, and this is as theoretical as I'll get. If you want to know more of the math, you'll have to stop me and ask questions. I, I'm used to speaking to chemical engineering audiences, so this is a, this is a unique experience for me. Um, so differential inequalities is an interesting theory. What it basically is is it's a set of sufficient conditions under which some postulated lower bounding trajectory and upper bounding trajectory will, in fact, be guaranteed bounds on, on all possible solutions. And the conditions are, are simple. So the first condition is a condition on the initial condition, which is obvious. It just says whatever your lower bounding and upper bounding trajectory are, they have to start out above and, and below all possible solutions of the real ODE, so it's simple enough. And then the meat of the conditions are these differential inequalities. And what these say, for example, is that the, the time derivative of the upper bounding trajectory has to dominate, in some sense, the largest possible time derivative of, of the real system. So fi here is the same fi in, in, in the original dynamics. Now, it's, it's the range over which that max is taken that, that, that's interesting. So, of course, it has to be over all possible values of our uncertain parameter. And it has to be over all possible state vectors within the current bounds. So if the current bounds are, are valid, then I know my real state has to be in this range. And if I dominate the right-hand side for all those values, I should, should be good. Now, the interesting part is, is this constraint here, which says actually the upper bound you know, the rate of change of the upper bound only has to, essentially the upper bound has to be growing faster than the real trajectories 
but only when the, the state of the real trajectory is incident on the i upper bound. I here is the same as, as I here, so that's a particular state. And the, the, the rationale behind this constraint, which is really central to the method, is, is essentially the method of proof is, so suppose I have a real, so these are some postulated upper and lower trajectories. Suppose I have a real solution that at some point in time runs into the upper bound. What I need to be able to guarantee is that exactly at such a point, the upper bound is growing faster than, than the real trajectory, right? And if, if I can guarantee that the time derivative of the upper bound dominates that of, of the real trajectory, then these will sort of have to go apart in, in the right order, and the, and the upper bound will still be an upper bound. Now, what's interesting about this condition is it's saying, I don't care if the, if the red trajectory grows faster than the upper bound here, because it's not at the upper bound yet. I don't need to worry about it yet. But I do care about it here. And so that's why you get to add that, that constraint. And that has a big impact on the quality of the bounds. It's, also, when people code this, they, the first time, they almost always leave that out and say, hey, why are my bounds way worse than in your paper? Um, so the argument I just gave you about the, the derivative, this derivative being greater than that one and, and the bounds moving apart, that is actually true if everything holds with strict inequalities, as I've shown here. And it's, it's very easy to prove. We actually use the theorem with weak inequalities. It's much, much harder to prove in that case that, that x dot u being bigger than an x dot means that the trajectories don't cross each other in that case. You end up needing a Lipschitz condition or a local Lipschitz condition on f, and, and the proof is much, much more difficult. But anyway, it, it's nevertheless true. So we apply it with, with weak inequalities everywhere, which is better computationally. So the way that you actually implement this, this theory in, in code is so here's my original system of differential equations written component-wise. What you do is you make an auxiliary system of differential equations that actually describe x lower and x upper as its solutions. And that's just because if you look back in the theory here, you're really prescribing differential equations for these. I mean, you're telling me what their initial conditions have to look like and what their rates of change have to look like. So it's, it's natural to specify them as differential equations. So I set x upper dot, for example, equal to this function fiu, which is an upper bounding function for, for fi that has to give me an upper bound on the range of fi over these ranges of, of inputs. So p is an interval that contains all possible uncertain intervals. x capital xt is my current interval bound on the state, which should contain the, the current state up to time t. And what the theory says is if I can somehow form these upper and lower bounding functions and I solve these differential equations with a standard numerical differential equation solver, the solutions I get will, will be guaranteed upper and lower bounds on, this, on all the states of, of the original systems. Um, this is where the method gets its, its efficiency, is you're just using a conventional numerical integrator to solve the system of equations. Now, how these FL and FU are formed is, is based on something called interval arithmetic, which some of you are familiar with. Um, the only thing to realize here is, is right, if I want to get an upper bound on the range of F over this region, if F is nonlinear, in general, this is, a, is an NP-hard global optimization problem. And, and I, I need to bound it at every time. So as the numerical integrator is solving this, it's calling this function over and over and over again. So you might, might call this function several thousands of times. So whatever I do here by, by way of getting an upper bound has to be some very cheap thing. And so we use interval arithmetic, which of course is, is not giving you exactly this max. It's giving you something much more conservative. So, so that's where the interval arithmetic comes in. Um, now, in order to make the explanation easier, I've lied to you a little bit here. So it turns out this is not what the, this is the, the, the naive way of implementing the method. The right way of implementing the method is instead of putting x here, the current bounds, you put this thing beta i u x. And what beta i u does is it takes the current x interval and it selects the i upper face. And this beta i l selects the i lower face. And what this is saying is I actually don't need an upper bound of, of f over the entire current x interval. I just need an upper bound over the i upper face. And that's, that's exactly this issue we talked about before of only caring about the situation when, when you're actually incident on the upper bound. So another way to put it is if my state is, is in the interior of the current bound, I actually don't care how these bounds change with time. They, they could, they, I don't have any conditions on them at all. The only thing I care about is once this trajectory runs into the i upper bound, now I have to impose a condition that says the upper bound has to grow faster than this trajectory can, can possibly grow. So it's just the observation that in, in, in continuous time systems, 
it, it really only matters what the vector field looks like on the, on the boundary of this set rather than on the interior of it in terms of reachable set computations. So this is the way to encode that in the method is I only use an upper bound on F over, the, over one facet of the current box rather than the whole box. And, and that gives me a, a smaller upper bound and, and tighter bounds. Questions about that so far? Okay. So, so you get these bounds as the solutions of, of auxiliary systems of ODEs. Um, these upper and lower bounding functions for F are, are, are calculated automatically using interval arithmetic from, from a, a symbolic expression of F or just using operator overloading, for example. Um, then you solve this numerically with any state-of-the-art simulator. You get upper and lower, lower bounds very efficiently. The trouble with this basic method is you get, you get very weak bounds, as I showed you before. The reason you get weak bounds is, again, because you're using interval arithmetic to calculate these, which, which is a conservative, uh, conservative arithmetic. I'll give some examples of that later. But, so here's, here's basically what you can expect to get out of this method. So this is a, a, a model of, of this reversible chemical reaction happening in a batch reactor. Here are the, are the dynamics. The, the red values, which are reaction rate constants, are taken to be the uncertainties, so they, they lie in, in some range. This is a plot of the concentration of C versus time. All of the red trajectories are, are real solutions for parameters in this range. And this is the upper bound and, and the lower bound that you get from, from basic differential inequalities. And you know, indeed, they are rigorous upper and lower bounds. But you, know, you can see the point. They, they, they're uselessly weak after a very short um, period of time. Yeah. So, so when, the, when the real trajectory hits the uh, bound, uh, you said you want to make sure that the rate of the bound goes faster. Mm -hmm. Now, when it goes down, would you also lower it? I don't have precise control over it, but yes, it's possible that it would that it could reduce. But you don't. You don't do that. How do I say this? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm putting a function here that gives me a guaranteed upper bound over this particular face right. of the interval. Now, if all of the real trajectories or all of the real trajectories that could be incident on the upper bound are decreasing at that point, then it's possible that this function will give me a negative value and that the bound will decrease as well. But it depends how conservative this bound is. It's, it, if this is computed in a, in a conservative way, because this is not giving me an exact bound on the range of the function. It's, it's, it's too expensive to compute an exact bound on the range of the function. So it, you could see the bound go down. But if this is, is a conservative bound, it, it could still be a positive number and be going up. Uh, how do you actually get the bounds? I solved, oh, yeah. I solved this system of ODEs numerically. So here these FIs are just continuous, some, some continuous yep. Uh, yep. Or? Yeah, by the rules of interval arithmetic, they have some mins and maxes and things in there, but they're, they're locally Lipschitz functions. You can feed them directly to any, any numerical integrator. Okay, so this is actually a, a question. So if FI in, uh, originally was a polynomial, then FIL and FIU might be non, non, non polynomial afterwards, right? They yes. can now involve yeah. non. Yep. Yeah, they'll be non, non smooth in general, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I had some reason to care about it, we could probably formulate polynomial bounds, but never needed to do that. Basic interval arithmetic will not give you a polynomial result there, yeah. Okay, so, so you get this kind of overestimation. So, you know. Back when I started working on this problem in you know, about 2012, probably, so we started looking at this very simple example and trying to understand what's the cause of, of, of the huge mismatch here. One of the things we noticed pretty quickly is that this system has a lot of, of special structure in it. So if I look at the state space here, concentration of, of A, B, and C, um, it turns out that, that all of the action all of the solutions of this lie on a one-dimensional manifold in, in, in this space. And the reason is this reaction hope happens in a, in a closed system. And so um, it turns out there's a conservation of mass relationship. It, if I sum up the concentration of A, B, and two times the concentration of C, that's always equal to what it was at the initial condition. So this is a, a physical insight if you know anything about chemical reaction kinetics, but it doesn't need to. It can be a mathematical insight, too. It's just to say, if, if I go back to these equations, if I add one times this equation to one times this equation to two times this equation, everything will cancel out. I, I, will, I will generate an, a, a linear combination of states whose time derivative is exactly zero. So this is a, a linear solution invariant for the system. 
Um, it, it's encoded in the original dynamics, and it means that all the solutions lie on this cyan uh, uh, hyperplane here. Um, there turns out to be another linear invariant you can come up, which is a, it's a stoichiometric ratio, and this is basically, you know, the physical observation is that whenever one molecule of A reacts, one molecule of B also has to react. So that those concentrations are tethered in that way. So this linear combination turns out to also be uh, invariant, and that means everything also lives on this green plane, and, and the red line is the intersection of, of those two planes. So the, the original differential inequality methods is, is going to create an upper and lower bound for every variable, so the bound looks like a cube in this three-dimensional space, where really all the solutions are just somewhere on this on this red line. Okay, so of course we started looking at was there some way that we could we could exploit that property? Um, so we can. I'll show you in a moment how how we do it. But this is is what happens with the bound. So this this is the original lower bound from a couple slides ago. This is the original upper bound, which I've just truncated here. It goes much worse, as, as I showed you before. And these blue bounds are what we get when we, when we take into account these relationships. And they're, in fact, the exact upper and lower bounds in, in this case. So you get a big improvement by taking these into consideration. So we looked at lots of different ways to do that. Here's, here's basically the general way that we do it. So suppose I have a system, same, same system I looked at before. And now somehow I know that there's some set, some enclosure I know in advance, which might just be simple things like conservation of mass or some of my states are always non-negative. I know this from the physics of the problem, for example. Um, if I have some, some set which contains all possible values, I've written it jointly as un combinations of uncertainty and, and states here, then um, we use a slightly modified method, and, and it's, it's based on this interval refinement operator. And so basically the idea here is I have a reachable set that I'd like to get a bound on. This G is my a priori enclosure, which is, is not supposed to be tight. It's just some, some simple observations like conservation of mass about the solutions. If at time t my bounding method is giving me this interval, um, then what I can do is, is before I use this interval to, to propagate the bounds forward in time, I can feed it to this interval refinement operator, which basically returns me a new interval that just has to contain the intersection of the original interval and this a priori enclosure G, which I know. So the interval refinement operator might just observe in this case, it can move this lower bound up, up, to, this, up to this point. Now again, if G is complicated, I can't find the exact, uh, let's say, interval hull of, uh, of the intersection here. I have to do some cheap computation. Uh, and so, so what we do is, is once I define what this interval refinement operator is, I just embed it in the bounding equations. So now instead of taking, say, the upper bound of Fi over that particular face of the box, what I do is I feed that face of the box to this refinement uh, operator. This refinement in operator gives me a smaller interval that's thrown out some regions that I know are impossible because they're outside my constraint set G, and then I bound the function over that. And by embedding this in, in, in the right-hand side function of the bounding equations, this refinement is happening continuously in time. It's happening this is every, every point in time along the way, which is important for this to work, to work well. Um, okay, proving that this gives valid bounds is not so easy. Uh, again, um, differential inequalities theories gets, gets a little muddy when you try and use weak inequalities. Um, we end up needing that this interval refinement operator satisfies a kind of Lipschitz condition. Um, so th this, this is an operator that takes intervals and returns intervals. So you can write the Lipschitz condition in terms of a, of a Hausdorff metric. Um, it, this can be made local, but you need some kind of regularity condition on this interval refinement operator. And it also can't have a return to you the empty set. And so there are some technical conditions it has to satisfy. So we make this, this simple operation. And then again, I mean, the reason it needs to be some kind of very cheap iterative interval kind of refinement is that it's getting embedded in the right-hand side. So when I solve these ODEs numerically, this right-hand side function is getting evaluated you know, hundreds of thousands of times. And so th this has to be a very cheap operation. So so, um, so the calculation of this operator IFG is local? Yes. In time? It's point-wise in time, yeah. And yet uh, the, the Lipschitz condition is to guarantee that the bounds you got is going to be global? It deals with a, with a situation where um, I would say this is it's just yeah. yes. You, you need it to show that the bounds can't cross. I mean, there, there's it's possible for me. I mean, if I make two functions, you know, theta 
and psi um, at the point where you know where theta t equals psi of t. Um, in this case, I also have that. Let's say the derivative. How do I want to write this? I'm I'm hoping that psi will will remain an upper bound, which fails in this case, and so the differential inequalities condition is something like that. Okay. So, so this is true. I mean, this shows you the problem with, with weak inequalities. So this, this is true. When psi runs into to phi, I have this bound on the derivatives. And nonetheless, I, I actually get a crossing of the bound. So you just can just be a cubic, for example, and you get zero derivatives right there, right? So, so this, in general, is not true, um, that that condition is enough. If you want that condition to be enough, uh, what turns out to be sufficient is is if I if I postulate that both phi or sorry psi and phi are solutions of ODEs and those ODEs have Lipschitz continuous right hand sides, it prevents this possibility from happening. Um, and so, because I'm now embedding this refinement operator inside the bounding right hand side, I need this whole right hand side to be a Lipschitz continuous function of of the bounds, and that's why I need the operator to be Lipschitz. Otherwise, you can get this. Um, in practical, but possible case. And, and so far, uh, the constraint is provided to you by someone else, and you show what to do with that. Yep, exactly. Yep. OK, um, so we tried this in a, in a bunch of cases. So here's a, a uh, it turns out that reaction kinetic networks have lots of these affine solution invariants we were looking at before. So this is, a, is, is an enzymatic reaction. It's a little motif that happens all the time in, in biochemical reaction networks where um, a species A maybe gets phosphorylated and then phosphorylated again. And then it, it goes through several activated states. And then it goes back to its original, um, to its original state. And in these kind of networks, what you can imagine is that all of these four different forms that, that the molecule A can exist in if I sum those four together, they should be the same as they were at the initial time. It's just the proportions that change. So there turn out to be like three of these in, in this network. And when we look at biochemical networks um, more, more broadly, you can find loads of these. And when we, when we use them, you get, you get much improved bounds. So here's several states from, from that example. That's the, the motivating one I used originally. Again, red are the real trajectories. The black dashed is standard differential inequalities. And the blue are the bounds we get when we use differential inequalities with this refinement operator embedded. Okay? So it makes a very, very significant difference in the quality of the bounds. You get nearly exact reachability bounds in, in, in this case. Um, and the, the cost in this case is, is very low. Now, this, this is a bit of a bad comparison. Um, standard DI takes 0.027 seconds to, to integrate these bounds. The cost is actually cheaper with the refinement operator. That's not typically the case because you do pay a cost for running this iteration in, in each. Um, but what's happening here is the numerical integrator struggles with the exponential explosion here, and it, it causes a bad uh, step size sequence that, that you don't have. So it can be competitive or, or even cheaper. And it's 250 times faster than the state-of-the-art zonotope method, which was the, the method in, in gray here. So these simple constraints basically give, give you a lot of benefit in terms of uh, reducing the conservatism without um, sacrificing the cost. And one thing I should point out is for these kind of, uh, of networks, it's not hard to find these, these solution invariants. So the, you can write these dynamics uh, in terms of something called the stoichiometry matrix, which essentially encodes the topology of the reaction network. It's an encoding of, of, of that network. It turns out that the vectors in the left null space of that matrix are, are exactly the linear combinations that are constant in, in these systems. So you can you can get those automatically. Uh, OK, so we tried to do this with nonlinear invariants. So here's uh, the Lotka Volterra predator prey model. This is an oscillator. Uh, it turns out to be a conservative oscillator. It doesn't dampen. So, so there's essentially an energy that, that's, that's invariant for the system. It's this nonlinear equation. Same thing. We do a refinement operator based on this and embed it in the dynamics. Here's standard differential inequalities. And the, the gray shaded region are the true solutions and the red Circles are the bounds we get um, using the invariance. Okay, so um, we get these bounds which are nearly exact out to they're starting to diverge a little bit after three cycles. Um, you should know, by the way, that these kind of oscillating systems are uh, are the worst possible case for bounding algorithms. It's the the game is not 
to get the bounds not to blow up. It's a contest of how many cycles you can go before it does blow up, because it eventually it, it's, I mean, and it's for the same reason that you can't numerically integrate this system without specialized algorithms, because the numerical error that is introduced at each step never dampens. It just, it just keeps growing. Um, but so we get these bounds that are nearly exact out to three cycles for the cost of only seven simulations of, of the original trajectories. It's almost 400 times faster than than the next best method in the literature, which uses a much more complicated set representation um, to get bounds that are that are of that quality. Okay, so the conclusion so far is that so what we know is is if I can use differential inequalities plus these constraints, it's typically much more accurate than standard differential inequalities. But so what? If your system doesn't have any of these invariants, you're still stuck, right? So um, so how can this be extended to cases? where I either don't have constraints or I, I don't know them. I wasn't smart enough to realize that the dynamics implied this, which I certainly wouldn't have been if I hadn't read a paper that told me it. Um, I noticed your bound for the parameter is very tight. Yes. Uh, so how, how, how sensitive is your method uh, if, the, if the bound is, you know, is bigger? For oscillators, very. Yeah. Huh? For oscillators, very sensitive. Very for, sensitive. for stable systems, much less so. Yeah, that's exact. It's like this. I mean, this is taken from other papers that have done bounding for this algorithm. This is they're they're that tight exactly because with and it's not just the bounding method. It's the actual dynamics. The 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 dynamics are very sensitive to the initial condition because the, the effect accumulates over time and it, it's, it's never dampened in this case. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but have you looked at all at actually finding the constraints? Uh, we're getting there. Because in there. So no, and, and the answer roughly is no other than accumulating a lot of examples that we've done by hand and trying to learn some general ideas from that. Have you ever seen examples in which uh, the existence of such a constraint depends on the values of the parameter, in particular whether the parameter could be an integer or not? So for integer values of the parameters, say there is a constraint and for non-integer there are no constraints. Have you ever seen such systems? I've never seen that. Um, we do not have the ability to bound over integer sets of parameters. I mean, I could bound over the interval hull of those integer sets of parameters. And what, what you've given me a little pause about is I'm trying to think if under our hypotheses it's possible for what you say to happen. Um, because it, what I think of just generally mathematically is that as the parameter changes continuously from one value to another, I should never encounter a qualitative change in the solution behavior. There, is, there shouldn't be bifurcations or anything like that because of the regularity assumptions I've imposed on, on the right-hand side function. So I'm wondering if, if, if the case you're discussing is possible so under my hypothesis. Ben Levy, when you could you say something, something about that? How would you write it as a system of ODEs? Um, so there's, there's two ways to do that. I mean, uh, in that case, it's, it's, uh, it's not really Hamiltonian, but it, it's sort of, it has a um, modified Hamilton's uh, form. So there's a polynomial for which you can use uh, the same uh, technique as you would with uh, ordinary Hamiltonian system to obtain uh, the, the, the system for that, for those equations. So you start with a, a polynomial, and uh, if you take the derivative with respect to the corresponding variables, that allows you to write this. So, so you're saying you can write down a, an order two system yeah. with the polynomial right-hand side? Yeah. That depends on the parameter, and the existence of a polynomial constraint depends yeah. on whether a parameter says an integer. Um, yes. So now that you say it, I mean, it, it, I can certainly come up with trivial examples where, you know, x dot equals p, right, lives, lives on invariant, you know, x equals no. zero if okay. p is zero and otherwise it doesn't, right? So okay. it's like, okay. yeah, cer certainly, yeah, yeah, but, uh, certainly this can happen, yeah. So I would say um, what we would do in that case is what I'll show you in the next few slides is that we've now extended this to... One way to view the extension I'm now going to show you is that we can deal with quantities that are nearly invariant rather than actually invariant. Um, and they don't even, I mean, 
the theory isn't valid or invalid based on what I mean by nearly. It's just a matter of whether or not it will be effective at reducing the bounds. So, mm -hmm. um, so you can put in things that are not true invariants, and we will make use of them. The extent to which they're effective will depend on how invariant they, they in fact are. And so if you had a narrow range of parameters around, say, p equals 0, where there was an invariant, you might be able to make some use of it. How would the method change if you treat, let's say, P1 and P2 as also differential determinant, but put in the equation that it's derivative zero, so that you don't have parameters? In this case, you would get the same. You, it would, it would be, you would just have then initial condition uncertainty rather than parametric uncertainty. Right. And it, the method would be the same. You'd get exactly the same bounds. Because this thing depends on initial conditions, right? Right, right. But um, so do you do you have bounds on the axis too? I mean, you were trying to find the bounds on the axis, right? Mm -hmm. So and I, I assume I have them at the initial time. Right, but but suppose now if, if the p one and p two are now treated as variables, yep. Then then you would also be finding the bounds of p one and p two, right? But I would have to have them at the initial time. Right, you have and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and if, so we could give you an initial and if the derivatives, so say, if I say p one is three and p two is uh, one, yep, then uh, your method would give a bound on p one and p two too, right? Is that correct? It would, but it would just it would it, they would just be constant from the initial condition. They'd be totally determined by the initial condition, and they'd have zero derivative, be because you know. If you told me that the right hand side for those variables was zero, I would choose the lower and upper bounding function mm -hmm. zero. So these right hand sides would be zero for those variables, and, and the bounds would just sit at their initial values indefinitely. Somehow, um, okay. if you if you if you add, you know, if, if you tell me, okay, so I'm going to make p a state, and so now I I bound its initial condition, and then I tell you that p dot is zero, right? Then my, the corresponding bounding system is, is going to be, you know, p lower at t naught is, is equal to, you know, the lower bound of this guy, and, and p lower dot equals zero. And so that's going to be appended to the bounding system, and, and the solution is just going to be that p lower stays at its initial value forever. So how, how about the, um, the timing? Have you tried to, to run both and then see whether the, which one? You in terms of efficiency? Yeah. I mean, the computations would be essentially identical. That I would just have, it, it, I guess it would be slower to do what you're suggesting because this system would be higher dimensional. Right. But it would have trivial right hand side, so I assume it wouldn't add too much time. And the other thing I should mention here that I didn't from the beginning is at the very end of the talk, I'll give a method that actually requires P to be time invariant. But everything I've told you so far works if p is a time varying disturbance. Um, no. So p can be a time varying function that lives in the interval capital P pointwise in time. And I think the only thing I have to assume there is that it's, 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 it's integrable. So are, are there examples where the parameters actually depends on the uh, states, x? For example, with chemical reactions, you know, once you get past a certain threshold, it can suddenly you know, change. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, like an atomic bomb or something. I mean, the, 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 the bounds would include that case because, like I said, it, they're valid for P being any time varying parameter as long as it stays in the prescribed, in the prescribed bounds. No, but what I'm saying is that if you treat P now no, no longer as a constant, but actually it depends on maybe feedback from the X's. Yep. Then, uh, um, then the two systems would be different, right? Okay. In other words, in, other words in, in, your, in your chemical reaction, the case could actually depend on the actual concentration. Yes. Right? So right, it, now, right now you're assuming that it doesn't, right? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Fine. I'm assuming that it doesn't, but again, I, what I'm trying to argue is that the reachability bounds we get are containing those solutions anyway because, well, sort of. If as long as you said, however, however p depends on x, and wherever x ends up being in state space, 
if the corresponding p-value still lives in capital P, then these bounds are still valid. But if I don't have capital P, if you're saying the only way I know where P is is if I, ha I have to know where X is first and then there's right. some feedback law, then that would have to be embedded in, in the system. And, yeah. So, so you're not a, this cannot model the, some atomic bomb? I'd have to look at those equations in more detail, but but I mean the situation you're saying just changes my definition of f. I just don't have a parameter anymore. I just have a, a you right. know I just compose this with another function of x, right? right? So yeah. I mean at least in the case where I know exactly how p depends on x, if I know that function explicitly, then I, I would just plug it in here and redefine this as an autonomous system with a with a more complicated expression. Okay, um, all right, so, so, so now here's sort of the more counterintuitive idea. It's what we call differential inequalities with manufactured constraints. So the idea here is, um, you know, again, I know this is working really well when I have a constraint. If I don't have a constraint or I don't know what they are, what can I do? Um, the idea is, well, let's just make some. So here's exactly the same reaction system I showed you before. A plus B goes to C, except now instead of in a, in a batch reactor that's closed, I put it in a flow system. So A and B continuously flow in, and whatever lives in the tank at each instant in time is continuously removed. That actually destroys all of the solution invariants we showed before because there's no, it's an open system, so there's no longer conservation of mass, for example. So this system, try as you might, there are no... Uh, combinations of the state variables that, that will give you a zero derivative in this case. Um, okay, so what's the strategy? Well, we just start making up new variables. Okay, so I define something called XD and, and XE, and I just define them as, you know, let's say for now just random linear combinations or even nonlinear combinations of the states. Okay. Uh, yeah. Question, so is X, uh, X A, A in, is it a constant? Yes. I mean, it could be an uncertainty, but it's, it's, it's not a, it's oh, not okay. a state so it's, variable. It's a yes. mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, so, so I define some, some new states that are functions of, of the old state. So these are redundant. There's no reason for me to keep track of these. Uh, um, but nevertheless, if I differentiate these expressions and I, and I substitute in these right-hand sides, I can get differential equations for xd and, and xe. And I can now append these to this system. So I can work in a higher dimensional state space. And... Now what's happened here is I have chosen these particular linear combinations um, so as to cancel out terms I don't like here. So remember, red terms are uncertain, okay? I'm taking xA minus xB, for example, because that will cancel out this term. So all of the overestimation in my bounds that comes from this nonlinear term will, will go away. So I create these two new states that are independent of uncertainty, and the idea is even a really cheap stupid interval method should be able to do a good job with these simple equations, okay? And so what I'm going to do is make a, a lifted now five-dimensional system by adding those equations to the, to the original. These are now independent to the uncertainty. They don't have to be, but it's a nice feature that they are. And I have solution invariants. The solutions of this, of this system in five-dimensional space live on a three-dimensional manifold. Uh, and, and they are that manifold is, is, is described by these two constraints, which are just my definitions of XD and XE in the first place. Okay? So I know that at every point in time, whatever bounds I get on this, I shouldn't contain any points that violate these constraints, and if I do, I can throw those, those regions out. So now I apply a, a fast, a cheap interval-based bounding method to this lifted system rather than the original one, and at every instant in time along the way, I use my interval refinement operator to tighten the bounds based on these two constraints, which I've essentially just made up and introduced in, into the system, okay? And that turns out to be remarkably effective. So these are the, the real trajectories for XC. This is the upper bound and lower bound in black from the original method, and using this approach, we get the blue bounds here, which are much, much tighter bounds. The computation time is, is increased by a small factor in this case, but still, still very fast, okay? So this tends to perplex a lot of people. I'll give you, let me see, I'll give you the general method and then another example, and then I'll, I'll try a couple of different ways to explain to you how this helps. But I mean, generally what people think is there's no new information here. You're just fiddling with the equations. How can you possibly generate tighter bounds in this case? And um, it has to do with some 
peculiar, peculiarities of, um, of interval arithmetic. So the general method here is I, I start with my original ODEs. I define some redundant states. The symbolic problem that, that you're probably interested in is how do you choose G? I don't know. We have a lot of manual examples where, where we've done it, but that's an interesting question. Um, I differentiate this expression to create a, a lifted system of, of differential equations. Um, so basically, if, if my original system lived on this axis marked X, I'm, I'm lifting into another dimension. If this was my initial reachable set, it, it looks like this lifted into the higher dimensional state space, but it's, it's the reachable set stays the same dimension as it was originally. It, it can't get any volume in this, in this new space because these are totally redundant with the original states. Um, I now have a, an invariant or a manifold, if you like, that every trajectory of the system satisfies. So although I don't know the reachable set a priori, I know that all the solutions lie on this green line, which is just the, the line defined by this equation. And I apply my DI method, and if at any point in time I have an interval bound on the true reachable set, so the reachable set's red and my bound is orange here, what this looks like in the lifted system is, is like this. And the hope is, if I've chosen G in a, in a good way, that this right-hand side function is somehow simple and easy to bound with simple interval methods. And so what I'm expecting to happen is that the bounds on Y are less conservative than the bounds on X, which is how I've drawn the picture. And so now if, if, it, if at some instant in time I have these current bounds that I've gotten from applying the method to the system, what I know is that I can throw away any points in this box that don't lie on, on the green line. So for example, I can calculate a refined interval here before moving forward with the calculation. And the argument is the bit that I've thrown out here has no intersection with the green line. And so I can't have any real solutions living there. Okay, so, so that's what's, what's going on. Um, here's another, another chemical engineering example where this works well. So this is a liquid-liquid extraction process. What happens is I, I have a, a, a one liquid phase going this way that contains some impurity that I'd like to remove, and I'm contacting it with another liquid phase with which it's immiscible, so that the, the liquids don't mix, they stay separate. And the idea is that the impurity should uh, preferentially dissolve in this other phase and be removed from, from the phase I care about. The dynamics of this, so this happens in multi-stages, the, the, the state variables are the level of impurity in, let's say, X is the green phase and Y is, is the blue phase. And the dynamics are, are very simple. Um, they have this, this Q, which represents the transfer of impurity from the green phase in, into the blue phase. And typically in separations models like this, all the complexity is in this, is in this Q variable because it depends on the, the thermodynamics of, of how, how the impurity likes to distribute itself between these two liquids in, in which it's soluble. So Q typically has a, an expression like this where I've put some red uncertainties. This is the, basically the underlying thermodynamics of the system, which tends to be a, a, a very nonlinear equation with a lot of uncertainty. In this case, I'm assuming you fit a polynomial to some, uh, to some um, experimental uh, phase equilibrium data for the system. And of course, the observation here is if I apply differential inequalities to this, I get bad overestimation of this Q term because it's ugly and nonlinear and has lots of uncertainty in it. And I get bad bounds on both X and Y, whereas the, the clever thing to do is to define a new state variable which is essentially a weighted sum of, of x and y. And it's, it's designed exactly so that this q term will cancel itself out in, 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 in the linear combination. So I get a new state with a new ODE that's independent of this q term. And so the idea here is, again, now I'm independent of uncertainty. I should be able to bound this term very well. And at each point in time, as I compute the bounds, if I have very good bounds on n, then hopefully I can infer better bounds on x and y, which are the variables I actually care about, because I know they're related by this equation. And lo and behold, standard differential inequalities diverges very, very rapidly to plus and minus infinity, and, and, and we get useful bounds through this procedure um, at a much higher cost. These are, are very bad times, because I think this was done in MATLAB instead of, instead of C++ in this case. But uh, anyway, much, much tighter bounds through this kind of a, of a procedure. Is that system underdetermined? Nope, it's fully determined. Q is okay, a function of x. Q is a known function of, of x and y. Yeah, what will x, x zero? What's the... Oh, I haven't, haven't written the initial conditions, but they're fixed. Oh, the, 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 uh, x zero. 
Not f of x of zero, but x zero. So have very that's fixed too. That's fixed too. That's the input to the process. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, good question. And, and Y6? Oh, yep, fixed, yeah. Oh, oh, that's okay, I got it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, that one's fully determined. Okay, so I, maybe I've convinced you that by generating equations that are somehow independent of uncertainty um, or less dependent on uncertainty that th this is, is the magic in the method. Um, but, you know, at least people still object a lot on the grounds that, you know, okay, sure, this cancellation happens here, but this is this is still just an equation that's implied by the original dynamics. And why should I need to do this cancellation explicitly? Why? Why? I mean, if I solved, you know, real trajectories of this, I don't need to make such an observation. They just the numbers cancel out when you do the calculation. So, um, so what's going on here that's actually making this so much better? Well, the 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 way I need to explain this is to is to just point out that again we're we're calculating those upper and lower bounding functions for the right hand sides using interval arithmetic. And e expressions that are equivalent in, in real arithmetic are not equivalent in interval arithmetic. And that, this is the key idea. So a simple example is if I take the function x minus x squared, I can rewrite that exactly equivalently as x times the quantity 1 minus x. And yet if I apply interval arithmetic, assuming that x lives in the interval 0, 1, I will get different results. And the reason is, so. Um, the interval 0, 1 squared, the result of that still lives in 0, 1. And, and so then you're, you're asking, what's 0, 1 minus 0, 1? And the, the thing that makes interval arithmetic able to cheaply get upper and lower bounds without having to essentially solve global optimization problems is that it will treat the two instances of x here as, as varying independently. So once you get to this stage, it just sees 0, 1 minus 0, 1, and it doesn't know that these variables are linked. So what it gives you is, any possible value in here minus any possible value in here. And you can quickly see that the result of that is, is anything from minus 1 to 1. Uh, here you have the same problem. This is not an exact bound, but it's better. Um, 1 minus x is still in 0, 1. So this gives me anything in 0, 1 times anything in 0, 1. And that still ends up bounded by, by 0, 1. So, um, so when you have multiple occurrences of the same variable in an expression, that's what's called the dependency problem in interval arithmetic. And it can give you. Um, it's why you overestimate expressions. And the way you write the expression can matter in how bad that overestimation is. And so one thing you can think about doing is, if you weren't worried about computational cost, is, well, if I just write the, the expression multiple redundant ways and just intersect the results, then I should get the best enclosure among all of them. Now, this is a bad example in the sense that um, one of them is decisively better than the other one, but this is not often the case. With more complicated expressions, it's very difficult to know which one will be better, and it's not, it's not even obvious that, that one of them is contained in the other. They, they could just have, an, say, the lower bound for this one could be better and the upper bound for this one better. Um, so, so this is a strategy used to reduce conservatism, but you have to be a little clever about how you choose the expressions because you can't just have 100 of them. It, it, take too much time. So I, I view what we're doing here as the extension of this idea to dynamic systems. So what I'm basically claiming here is that um, by adding this augmented dynamics along with this constraint that relates my new variable y to my old variable x, I'm somehow providing multiple redundant expressions for the original state x. So I, I, get, I get one set of bounds on x from applying the original method to the original dynamics, right? But I'm getting another set of bounds on x by applying the method to bound y, and then inferring bounds on x from those bounds on y on account of this equation, right? So I really have two different looks at the variable x, and I'm doing those simultaneously and, and, and essentially constantly intersecting them um, on account of that refinement operator. So that's, that's why this is, is working out well. Uh, so what are good invariants to add, right? This is getting more to the symbolic uh, question here. And again, I don't have any general algorithm for this. It's just Right, the observation so far is I want to make this right-hand side simple, quote unquote simple. Um, it would be best if it was zero. That's the case where the original dynamics actually satisfies an invariant. Um, if it can't be zero, then what I mean by simple is dictated by these issues of interval arithmetic. So simple has to mean easy to get good bounds on. So I should be trying to minimize the dependency problem uh, appearing in this expression. Um, you know, the easiest case to look at is, is the linear case. Let's suppose I, I only make new variables that are linear combinations of the original ones. 
My augmented dynamic is then just a, a linear combination of the original right-hand sides. And you know, what I can hope to do, as I've shown you in several examples now, is to generate some, some term cancellations when, when those linear combinations are, are taken. If I can get to zero, that's great. If I can't, at least I can cancel some bad terms. Um, and it may be possible that when I take this linear combination, some other algebraic simplifications become available. I can factor things in a certain way, for example. Um, so we would love to be able to do something clever symbolically there, you know, take in the symbolic expression of f and, and parse it and notice that if you took certain combinations, things would cancel or you'd be able to factor um, some uncertainty out and, and reduce the dependency problem in that way. But um, we have nothing but lots of examples to show how to do that. So, of course, you know, we went looking in... Is this an artifact of looking at very simple examples? If we look at really ugly nonlinear examples, can we still find these? Um, certainly in chemical engineering, you still can. So this is an anaerobic digester. It's, it's, it's pretty ugly. Um, my students spent quite a bit of time with this, but it, it, these are all the uncertain parameters, initial conditions and parameters. Um, but ultimately, it was able to find some, some things that cancel. I mean, so for example, if you look in x1 dot, you have this term mu1 of s, which mu1 is, is an ugly function down here, times x1. That same term, mu1 of s times x1, appears down here multiplied by a constant. So you can, you can cause cancellations in that way. So we came up with, with a couple of redundant states with simple uh, equations. And again, the, 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 the improvement is fairly stark. So standard differential inequalities here. Um, sorry, I've changed the color scheme on you a bit. The gray, the gray shaded region now are the real solutions, and the red are our bounds. So very, very sharp bounds. Um, very, very efficiently in, in this case by just adding those couple of redundant equations. So this is almost a thousand times faster than the next best thing in the, in the literature that, that can get good bounds for this kind of a, a system of this complexity. Um, okay, lack of Volterra, we can add more made up constraints in addition to the ones that, that already exist within the system. That leads to even more improvements. So now we get good bounds over, over many cycles. You can see they, they are diverging. We will lose this battle eventually, but we're getting many more cycles than, than we could before. Um, could, could, yeah. Could you, so could you maybe give some rationale behind these constraints? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Espe could. Especially the last one. <laughs> yeah. So, so these ones are, are actually sort of more intelligent. So if you take the derivatives of these, you, you, you can actually see Right, so x dot divided by p1 is, is just going to be that expression. Ah, so, which has so an, there are no p's there. Which has an x1, x2 term. x2 ah, mm -hmm. dot divided by p2 is, is going to have, okay. it, well, that's a typo, actually. There should be an x1, x2 term there. So you, you, you are generating some cancellations there when, when, when you take the, the flow of these, of these equations. So these are sort of generated in that way. Um, this is, is just a brute force. Um, what the sine and cosine are doing uh, are, are just encoding facets of a, you're basically, these are facets of a polytope in the two-dimensional state space with, that, that are just rotating at a fixed number of degrees each time. So it's saying, rather than just upper and lower bounding the coordinate dimensions in the state space, upper and lower bound different ah, but slices so this, of it. This is something you can do like in, in, in any case, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And does yeah, that, it's not really unique to this example. But does, does this really help for every system or only for some? Mm -hmm. For a lot, it's just more expensive, right? I mean, the, the game here is the more of these new equations you add, the more expensive the bounds get, right? If I lift from a 10-dimensional system to a 40-dimensional system, I'm not going to maintain the, the computational efficiency, right? So, um, so the game really is to find ones that are, are clever and actually cause some nice cancellations. These are more brute force ones. So you can see it here, right? I mean, mm -hmm. again, this is a small system, so the computation time is still trivial, but it's, it's, it's an order of magnitude worse than in the original case. Um, so we got very interested then in, in trajectory tracking problems because it was funded by the Air Force. So we wanted to look at vehicle dynamics. And, and one of the things we started noticing very quickly is that chemi examples look like x dot equals nonlinear term 1 plus nonlinear term 2 plus nonlinear term 3. They're these long sums of terms. And those terms appear in many right-hand sides. And just by taking linear combinations, you can cancel them out and do a lot of good. Whereas when we looked at, at vehicle dynamics, the right-hand sides are all one term, and they look like this. There's, there's no way I can add x and y together and generate any kind of cancellation here. So you can think I can try and make some nonlinear in, in some nonlinear new variables that maybe I could get a cos squared plus sine squared that I could simplify or something like this, right? So we've tried all these kind of tricks. Um, 
moreover, there's a control input here. So in the trajectory tracking problem, um, typically the controllers are written in, in some kind of error dynamics. So here they transform the system into coordinates that are like the arc length along a reference trajectory and the, the lateral error of the, of the vehicle away from that reference trajectory. This is a simple car model. Um, and an error in the angle for the real vehicle versus the, the trajectory. And the controller is designed in, in, in this space, and the feedback controller in this model from the paper we got it from was the ugly thing. So now you have the additional complexity of all this mess substituted into the original dynamics. And, you know, so good luck finding clever um, ways to combine these states and get something to cancel. And we struggled with this for a long time, and this is where some symbolic methods would really be of great help. Um, a couple of things we did learn here, though, is, is that um, if somebody has designed a feedback controller in the error coordinates, you should probably make your bounds in those error coordinates, too, rather than the original coordinates, because what's going to happen as soon as I plug this control input in, so this, this omega is the, is the turning angle of, of it's essentially the steering wheel of, of the car. Um, this nonlinear term is going to cancel out, and indeed the controller is always designed to cancel out terms because that's what controllers do. They cancel out the natural dynamics and they impose in addition to that what they actually want to happen to the vehicle. So um, bound in the, in the dynamics where the, where the controller was, uh, was, was made because then you get some nice simplification. So if we sub that in, that things get a little simpler. This is the, the closed loop dynamics now. Um, the other thing, after staring at this for a long time and trying to figure out what, what combination of states would give us some nice new thing, uh, what we eventually realized is that all the control theorists have done the hard work for us on this, and a great choice of redundant state is a Lyapunov function. So if you know anything about controls, um, they're designed oftentimes in these nonlinear cases by a Lyapunov function. A Lyapunov function is somehow an energy associated with the system, so it's, it's a function of the original states, E and, and theta here. And the controller is so designed that the time derivative of this energy decreases, which is how you show that the error from the reference trajectory decreases asymptotically over time. Well, you know, if you look into the papers and you look at the proof of this, they actually take the derivative of V and they show that a bunch of stuff cancels out. And at the end of the day, you get some really simple thing that, that, that in fact, you already know the sign of. So our idea is, all right, we should definitely take V and add that as a new state to the system and add, add this definition as a nonlinear constraint. Gives us a very simple bounding ODE. And in fact, when you do that, here's what you get. So shaded region are the original trajectories. Red is standard differential inequalities applied in the error coordinates. The blue and green are just different ways we were testing of, of, of the, the interval refinement operator that enforces the constraint. So the, the blue is the best we've gotten. And so you can see, I mean, we're not right on the set of trajectories, but much, much tighter than what you get with the standard interval method in, in, in all three of the states. When you translate from the error coordinates back to the original um, space that you care about, so x, y as a function of time, again, the gray are the real trajectories. The red rectangles here are, are standard differential inequalities, and what we have is in, in the blue. So you, know, you can see if you're trying to, to verify, say, that you don't collide with a wall or something, it's going to be much more effective working with the blue boxes than with, with the red ones. Um, so we've tried this for a bunch of different um, trajectory tracking problems now, and it, it works pretty well. I mean, we could get tighter than that. We don't know how to solve that problem yet, but in general, we have, have some idea of what the right invariants to choose in those systems are, too. But again, it's all manual. We don't have any way of, of automatically calculating those. Okay, so last bit of the talk is, is, is of course, we're interested in automatic invariant construction. Uh, I don't want to have to have a student spend several months having some deep insight into how to choose these invariants every time. Um, we have one idea here that you could hardly call symbolic computing, but it is effective, and, and the idea is, is, is quite goofy. So what we thought to do is let's make the new variables just the parametric sensitivities of, of the original dynamic system, so the derivative of each xi with respect to the uncertain parameters, and I will augment the original ODEs with the parametric sensitivities. Um, so this is just the standard forward sensitivity equations you get from taking the, the, the derivative of, of, of this equation with respect to the parameters. Um, so you can write the parametric sensitivity equations as, as functions of these new state variables, S. Um, so so this, the parametric sensitivities now play the role of, of Y. Um, so now I have my higher dimensional system. And what I know is that the, the states, so to speak, of this higher dimensional system, which are just x and its sensitivities, 
are related to each other essentially by first order Taylor expansion, right? Um, so I can write this first order Taylor expansion. Uh, on account of the mean value theorem, I know that I can write this with equality rather than, than an approximate equality if I evaluate the sensitivities at some unknown uh, point in, in, in P that lies on the, on the convex combination of, of these two points. So that's what the mean value theorem buys me. Because my reference point P hat and all of the P's I care about are, are in a convex interval, I know that, that this unknown point is always in this interval, so I don't need to know what that point, what that point is. So this is, not a, this is not a true invariant in the sense I've been talking about before, um, but it does admit a rigorous bound refinement because I know that if at any point in time I have a guaranteed bound on all possible sensitivity values, which I'll get from applying the bounding algorithm to the system, then um, even though I don't know this, this, this vector furnished by the mean value theorem, I do know that, that this thing has to live inside of that interval. And so I know that X has to be in the reference point plus this, um, this sort of interval multiplication of the, the uncertain, the, the, the Taylor expansion with the real derivative substituted out by that interval that contains all, all of the sensitivities. And so I can, I can make a kind of uh, um, invariant set that relates the solutions X and the solutions S by this approximate um, Taylor expansion. Now, the fact that this is not a true invariant, I mean, this is a, I'm giving you the short version of this where I justify this as kind of an automatic invariant generator, but it's really not a true invariant and, and the, the differential inequalities theory we had to, to develop to implement this was in a lot of ways totally different. So it's just, there was a lot of extra proving to be done there. So it's not really a direct application of what I've shown you, but nevertheless, it, it does work. And it's general in the sense that I don't have to make up any Y variables. I just directly put the sensitivities and that's fully automatable. Um, okay, so we refine an algorithm based on that. So here's the same uh, anaerobic digester we looked at before. So now I'm gonna get rid of the clever invariants my student came up with and just use the sensitivities and the mean value theorem. And we get almost exactly the same bounds from that. So we get very, very tight bounds just putting those in. Computation time is a little more. So here's what it was before. It's bumped up a little bit because there's a lot of parametric sensitivity equations. So the new variables you're adding now is, is nx times np. It's not ideal, but it is effective. And it's allowed us to address some, last example, it's allowed us to address some problems that we really couldn't address before. So here's a aircraft trajectory tracking example um, for a fixed wing aircraft that was given to us by the Air Force. Here's uh, um, the, the, the feedback control law that this thing is under, and they'd like to check that this doesn't collide with some obstacles as it moves through the space. And uh, we tried mightily for many months to come up manually with, with some combination of these states that would give us a nice, uh, a nice invariant that, that we could, could bound with and never got anything to work at all. And so eventually we developed this mean value theorem kind of approach with sensitivities. Um, and here's what you get with it. So another color scheme change, I apologize. The real trajectories are in green now. The red boxes are, are what we get with what we call mean value differential inequalities. The, the standard differential inequalities method gives you those bounds. So that's the same figure we had in the middle there. So again, if you're trying to verify that you don't, you're not gonna crash into an obstacle, I'd much rather work with the red bounds than with the, than with the black bounds. Um, the computational cost is not too bad in this case. So we're getting sharp bounds on 10 seconds of flight time. So you can verify the trajectory 10, 10 seconds in advance of where you currently are flying. Um, in hundreds of a second of CPU time. So this is actually fast enough to do real-time uh, collision avoidance calculations with. So the Air Force was quite happy with that. But you know, here's an example of one where you know, manually we had completely uh, uh, come up empty with trying to find a good invariant for that, but this automated method works well. Okay, so um, I think you get the point. So we have new methods for rigorous reachability bounds. The, the key new ideas are the use of manufactured redundant constraints and the use of, of what we call mean value differential inequalities, which is, 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 is at least one way you can think about automatically generating those constraints. We're consistently getting bounds that are much more accurate than existing methods that have similar computational complexity. Um, and in many applications, we, we're getting very good bounds fast enough to do online control applications. So um, the future work is, is all surrounding how, how to choose those, uh, those new variables and those new invariants to add. I mean, if you add a whole bunch of them, then you eventually start compromising the efficiency. So you need to be a little bit clever and selective about how you choose and add them um, and how you can determine a priori which ones are gonna be effective and not. And we need additional strategies for automatically generating them, which is, is you know, I mean, I think partially 
what I'm here to discuss is if there are any symbolic methods that, that you all are aware of that could help here, um, you can see it makes a big impact in these applications. So I've gone on for a very long time, I, I fear. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Can you go back to the liquid example where you have like that, the six tanks yep. of liquids? Oh, here. So I'm just wondering. So, like, you, uh, indeed, you, you you cancel Q, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, X and Y, they have Q in them, right? Yes. So, what, and, and it still helps. Yep. Although, yeah, you're right. Like, it's, it's, yeah, if it's, I differentiate one more time, the the Q will show up, right? It's yeah. It's it's not as if I'm getting perfect bounds on N. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Yeah, because you know X and Y are still bad. Because they still involve Q, but but, but, but it's, even, it's just a, even, it's a, even it's, this gives it's a cumulative effect. Mm -hmm. I mean, X and Y gain at some point in time a little bit of overestimation, mm -hmm. and they haven't infected N yet, and and I'm able to use a refinement to shrink X and Y a little bit because I have better bounds on N, and so that helps here and it, and it helps here, and so in the next step I have a little bit less. And you know what really shows you this dramatic difference is, is what's causing this is is the fact that these errors accumulate time step after time step after time step and they, they grow exponentially and that's what really kills this. So even a minor refinement early on can have a big impact on where the bounds ends up and end up down the road. I see. I see. Thank you. So so these are our experimental results. Correct. These better bounds are just from experiment. Do you have a theoretical analysis of the error uh, growth because of you introducing these new methods? Um, getting a bound on the, the overestimation error is extremely difficult. I mean, even in standard interval arithmetic, the only way that people really do this is in terms of convergence analysis. So you can look at, as the width of the uncertainty interval goes to zero, how quickly does my enclosure go to zero? Does that happen linearly, or does it have a quadratic convergence? Um, and that's an interesting analysis, but it's only relevant in certain situations. I mean, if you're going to start partitioning the uncertainty space, then you care about that kind of convergence. But if the, the uncertainty just is what it is, and it's not getting any smaller, then convergence doesn't really tell you. I mean, it's an asymptotic analysis. It doesn't tell you anything about the behavior at a, at a point. Now, I will say that. The last method I showed with the mean value theorem, because of the linearization that's going on there, we have proven that that actually has a quadratic convergence rate, whereas all of these methods have a linear convergence rate. And this is um, this is consistent with, with no, interval quadratic arithmetic. Quadratic convergence is better, right? Quadratic convergence is better right. in for small intervals. It can actually give you worse bounds for large uncertainty intervals. Yeah, so, so the, the width of the enclosure is bounded by a constant times the width of P squared. And so as the width of P goes to zero, it's obviously preferable, but it actually does continue to scale that way out to large P, and you see right. the width get worse than the linear methods. How much of this uh, straightforwardly uh, gets transformed to discrete time systems and how uh, and what, what does not? Absolutely not at all straightforwardly. We have a series of papers on, on this. Um, the reason it's not straightforward is so the use of this flattening operator is, is, a, is a completely continuous time argument that's central to differential inequalities. It says in continuous time if this trajectory leaves the box it has to first run into the bound. And so I really only care about what the vector field looks like on, on the bound, right? But in discrete time, this guy can go from in, in the interior in one hop outside. And so if I want this upper bound to grow fast enough to contain all trajectories, I have to do the naive method I show you and put the whole interval x here. And things get quite a lot worse. Now, this bothered us quite a bit. I mean, we tried to port all of this stuff to discrete time. And we ran into this issue, um, and we were getting very bad bounds. And what bothered me was that, you know, let's say I have an Euler discretized system, explicit Euler discretized system. In discrete time, I would have to use a bounding, a set of bounding equations that looks like this. In continuous time, it would look like this. And if I took look at the limit as the step size goes to zero, 
the discrete time system behavior approaches the continuous time system behavior, but the behavior of the bounds doesn't. Because in continuous time, I get to use this, this single face argument, and in, in discrete time, I'm stuck with the whole interval there. So, so we knew something was wrong here, and eventually we were able to show that you're justified in using this kind of, uh, this kind of an argument in all of our methods in discrete time, provided that you're, you've used certain discretization schemes and that the step size is below a certain threshold. So, so in some sense, the result is if the discrete time system approximates a continuous time system well enough, then you can use all the same methods and they work very well. Um, but if the discrete time system is not a good approximation of an underlying continuous time system, then, then and you can, you can very easily do a, an explicit Euler discretization with a step size that's too big and the methods all fail and you get invalid bounds. Now, what's interesting is, um, you know, we could argue that you shouldn't ever have that situation because it turns out that the step size bounds you need for this to be valid are the same step size bounds you get when you do, um, like, stability analysis and numerical methods. And, and so, so here's a, a particular example. If I have a system for which the positive orthant is, is invariant, so all the states are positive, it's possible to discretize that with explicit Euler with a step size so large that you actually produce negative solutions in the discretized system. Okay? And you can analytically prove a bound on the step size below which that won't happen. Turns out to be exactly the same bound we need for these methods to be valid. Okay, so if you haven't totally destroyed your system in discretization, then yes, this all works. But there's, there's an extra verification step there. And what about generating constraints? Is it the same? Same, exactly the same. Yeah. It, except combine the equations after you discretize them, not before. Because if you generate a nonlinear invariant in the continuous time system, it's not necessarily invariant for the discrete time system. But if you discretize the equations first and then take combinations, then you generate constraints that are valid in that. So lift the discrete time system, not the, the continuous time. The, the lifting and discretization don't commute. Yeah, so it wasn't any harder to find uh, um, constraints. No, I mean, if we could take all the examples I showed you today and it discretized this, this forward Euler systems and put the same constraints in, and then you get similar results. Okay. Um, for chemical reaction, that's probably all right. I suppose the, the input, the initial state is fixed. And once that's given, then you let the system run. Um, there's no change. Now, in terms of um, automation, Control. Mm -hmm. Usually, let's say a car or even the, the Boeing uh, 737 Max 8, um, there, there, there are um, driver input. So if the driver sees something and then he, he changes mm -hmm. by turning the wheel or stepping on the boat uh, mm -hmm. pedal or something, then how, how does this in real time be able to correct it? So, I mean, otherwise, I mean, we wouldn't have this crap, these two crashes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if the the, uh, the angle of, uh, of the airplane rise and the speed was within your couple that they found, yeah, then then it, it won't crash. Mm -hmm. It would be okay. Yeah, but that is if the driver doesn't do anything. Is that, is right. That right, the pilot doesn't. Right. Do if he does something and changing it, then that's yeah. why you got this wobble. So yeah. how how does how does this model? Um, would be able to handle yeah, we thought about this. More, I mean, more in terms of of autonomous systems, where I mean, the basic sort of collision avoidance problem you might look at is: I have an automated vehicle; it has a reference trajectory that it that it has planned out, um, you know, um, several seconds in advance, and it's going to follow that with a local feedback controller, trajectory tracking controller, and then we can verify under uncertainty whether that's a safe trajectory, and we can do it fast enough that there's time to recompute something else if if it's not. If it's not safe, um, if you have, but but you know, yeah, that's what you're saying. I have a totally deterministic system because right. you've told me the reference trajectory and you've told me exactly the feedback control law that it's going to be used to try and follow it. If you have a driver, um, you know, I mean, if the driver makes discrete inputs that where you can update, you know, you can basically recompute the bounds every time that happens, then then that doesn't seem to be a big problem to me. Otherwise, I mean, if you're saying I really have to account for anything that, that the pilot might do along the trajectory, I mean, what, what can you say? I mean, you have to give me at least some bounds on, 
on what he's able to do. And, and so this is a, this is a, stuff is under your control, I mean, under the automatic control. I mean, so even if the pilot tries to do something, yeah, counteracting it too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's why, you know, yeah, the plane was not under control basically because right. the, the two are fighting. Right. So how do you make sure that the computer wins? Uh, do you want the computer to always win? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, because I mean, according to the computer, it goes into a certain you know bounds, and that would be safe. Right. But what happened is that it's not safe right now. So do, do you get a, a problem assigned to you uh, by whom? Well, one of the things we're working on now, which is, is, is again, you know, these are subroutines in larger control algorithms, you know. Um, uh, one of the things we're working on now is, is the so-called backward reachability analysis problem, which is yeah. rather than telling me the initial conditions or the parametric uncertainties or the inputs, you tell me a target or, or a set of obstacles. And mm -hmm. the question is, characterize the set of, of inputs to the system yeah. for which I'm guaranteed to be safe. Yeah. Um, and these work for that too. It's a much more expensive computation. I mean, essentially, you embed the forward calculation in, in a branch and bound algorithm, and you, you know. Kind of reversing time. There are some tricks you can play with that, but I mean, the, 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 the stupidest thing, you, the least efficient thing you can do is, is just grid up the, the input space into small cells and run forward reachability analysis on all of them and right. test which one's safe, which one's not, very right? Expensive. It is, but it's still, I mean, that's the guaranteed way to do it, and then you can add other tricks on top of that to try and increase the efficiency. But the fact that we're getting such tighter bounds does increase the efficiency tremendously. So we can actually solve that problem the way I just described it um, for fighter jets, for example, with a, a, at least a few inputs. It's the dimensionality, the input space that really kills you there, not the state space, because that's the one you're partitioning. Um, we can solve that for pretty significant problems in, in, in a few minutes, whereas if you use the standard differential inequality bounds, you need to partition the input space so finely to avoid the explosion in the bounds that you never, you never finish. So I think that's what you'd have to do to answer your question. I mean, you, we could conceivably characterize, here's the set of things the pilot can do that will still be safe. Okay. Don't go outside of that, you know. Uh, you know and you could say, you know, the, the autopilot's got to override if they try and do anything outside of that, of that set. Other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again.